Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, you know, uh, wherever you're located. Uh, welcome to our Myeloma Crowd Roundtable webcast, uh, the first one of the year. As many of you know, we had planned to be in Miami today, but the Omicron variant had other plans for us. So we are very lucky and honored to have three of the best young minds working in myeloma research and treatment join us to discuss studies that they presented at the recent American Society of Hematology meeting. So now I will also discuss um, some of the other highlights of ASH with them before we go into our audience, audience questions. Be sure to enter any questions you have in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. I apologize in advance, we'll probably not get to them all, but we're going to get in as many as we can. So let's begin with introducing our guests today. Uh, Dr. Francesco Mara is assistant professor at the Sylvester Cancer Center at the University of Miami, where he works with Dr. Ola Langren who we'd hope to be with him in Miami today, but we'll reschedule for later this year. Dr. Mauro received his medical degree from the University of Milan, Italy, had a fellowship at the Wellcome Sanger Institute in Hickston, England, and worked with Dr. Langren at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York before coming to Miami. His presentation on the myeloma microenvironment was recognized as the highest ranking of this year's ASH scholars. Dr. Timothy Schmidt is an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, he was both chief fellow and fellow at Emory University's Winship Cancer Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. He also completed a residency at the University of Illinois at Chicago after receiving his medical degree at St. Louis University in Missouri. His presentation on chromosome one shows the way for future research on what may be a high risk disease marker. Dr. Sigrun Thorstein's daughter is a member of the Thorstein's daughter, sorry, is a member of the hematology faculty specializing in myeloma at the Rings Hospital in Copenhagen, Denmark. She received her doctorate at the University of Iceland and earning her after earning her medical degree at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Her presentation was one of many presented by her research partners on Iceland's groundbreaking study on the progression of myeloma precursor conditions. Iceland screens, treats, or prevents multiple myeloma study, better known as ISTOP-MM. This is the only nationwide study of its type in history, and we're very interested to learn more. Now, all three of our speakers are young, talented, and ambitious, and I'm sure we'll be seeing them for years to come, perhaps leading their own myeloma programs. Now, to learn more about today, short articles and agenda and the sponsor brochure were sent to you by email from our roundtable program director, Greg Brozite. Um, speaking of sponsors, I want to thank our sponsors, Amgen Oncology, Adaptive Biotechnologies, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, GSK, Janssen Oncology, Karyoform, and Decada Oncology, because without them, we cannot provide this very valuable, informative program for you, um, for everyone, patients and caregivers throughout the world. Now, should you have questions to submit, please click that Q&A again at the bottom of your screen. And thank you for giving us your time today on, on a Saturday. And thank you to the doctors for joining us. We're so thrilled. Um, let's get started with some background on some of your studies, and I'll ask each of you to kind of review your study for our, as best you can for our uh, um, audience, and which is obviously patients. Um, what were the main points for patients to take home? What do they mean for the future? Let's go by topic. Um, let's, we'll start with um, Dr. Thorstein's daughter and then go to Dr. Mara and then Dr. Schmidt before we take the rest of our time for our discussion. So we'll start with precursor conditions. Um, you know, maybe you want to explain a little bit more about this study if patients aren't familiar with it. And then what does it mean to me as a patient if I have active myeloma? And um, yeah, we'll start with you first. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Um, well, the ISTOP MM study is a, a nationwide study in Iceland where we invited um, everyone over the age of 40 to participate. And we have screened over 75,000 Icelanders for uh, MGAS, for the precursor condition, with uh, serum protein electrophoresis and free light chain analysis. And we wanted to do this because in recent years, a lot of scientists and doctors and, and patients have wondered if it's better to start treatment earlier in myeloma before there's organ damage. And there are some studies that have indicated that we should, uh, that it's beneficial for patients to start treatment at the smoldering myeloma stage, where you have a 
considerable amount of plasma cells in the bone marrow, but no organ damage. Um, and to do, to do this, because smoldering myeloma and amicus are asymptomatic conditions, we wondered if you should treat, or, or, sorry, screen for amicus. So we have done this in, in 75,000 Icelanders, which is 51% uh, of the target population. And, and that is a, a very high number. <laughs> That's huge. Yeah, it is. And then the Icelandic population is very willing to participate in, in studies like this too. And uh, we're very lucky with that. Um, and we, it's, a, it's not a very big country and we have really uh, good systems to keep track of the patients and a lot of registers that we can use. Um, and we have um, identified 3,700 individuals with MCUS. Um, and we have designed a clinical trial where we randomized these MCUS individuals into one of the three arms of the study. So in arm one, uh, they just follow care in the Icelandic healthcare system as if nothing had happened. So that's the blinded arm. And then we have arm two, where we follow uh, current guidelines, uh, international guidelines. And then we have arm three, where we have, where we have more intensive follow-up. And our main question that we want to answer is if screening for MCUS and treating early in myeloma improves outcomes for patients. And we are looking at survival, but also at quality of life. Because that's very important when you're screening people and, and telling them they have a precursor condition for something that would maybe never turn into a disease. Well, to um, me, but, yeah. no, there, yeah. there are so many, there are so many papers on this. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just curious about the findings, you know, what, yeah. what were your key findings? Well, we haven't we are not able to answer the question yet if there is a survival benefit of screening for MCUS. So we are not recommending screening right now because we don't know if it's good or bad for the population. The study that I presented it as was uh, the smoldering myeloma population that we have found. So we have also screened for smoldering myeloma because we do bone marrow biopsies on almost everyone uh, that is diagnosed with MCUS. And then we find out if they have smoldering myeloma or MCUS. So we have described the prevalence of smoldering myeloma. That is what my presentation was about because we haven't known until now how many people in the population have smoldering myeloma. And we found that 0.5% of everyone over the age of 40 had smoldering myeloma. Yeah. And that's a very high proportion. Yeah. Um, but most of the patient had low risk smoldering myeloma. So what is very interesting to find out is how many of these patients are patients that will develop myeloma. Um, because those are the ones that where early treatment would be relevant. And we use the current risk scores that uh, are available now and we offer those with intermediate to high risk smoldering myeloma to participate in a, a clinical trial. So they are offered treatment. And so, which treatment? Uh, I'm curious because there is a wide variety of ways smoldering myeloma patients are being treated, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, we give lenalidomide and dexamethasone to intermediate risk smoldering myeloma patients. We give carfilzomib, lenalidomide and dexamethasone to the high risk patients and those that are diagnosed with myeloma, because we also diagnose some asymptomatic myeloma patients. How many, I'm curious, how many um, active myeloma patients did you find out of that 75,000? We, were... have, we have found about 40 patients by now. Were they pri previously diagnosed with active myeloma or that was a surprise? No, Th those that were uh, had myeloma before, they were excluded. So these are patients that did not know they had myeloma before they were screened. Wow. So that could be very helpful. And what the 3,700 number was the MGAS patients or the yes, those with a, an M protein present or an abnormal FLC ratio. And the, were, how many smoldering myeloma patients did you find? 180 in the last, uh, when we last analyzed the data. Yeah, so interesting. Well, these, this study is very important, in my opinion. I, I think it's a wonderful way to screen. I mean, it's a very homogenous population, you know, but yeah, um, 
what a wonderful way to be able to screen that many people and to to now watch and this study i'm sure will go on for a very long time it right? will because we have to follow these patients right. to see if, if there's a benefit of screening um, so yeah it, it takes time also because survival is, is good in myeloma now especially when we treat early so yeah we we will need to see if yeah, there is a difference yeah to see the percentage of progression too right how many people yeah. progress and mm. how long it takes them to progress and exactly. um, did did they do genetic testing also as part of this study uh, well yes we are doing that but we had, we don't have the results yet but yeah we are doing genetic testing on both the amcos individuals and the smoldering and the, and the myeloma patients mm, because i know that i've heard from other investigators that they say like by the time you have smoldering myeloma, you most likely have the genetic features that you mm. probably have at the myeloma stage. So yes, be interesting. But, but I, I think a really important thing is is how you diagnose smoldering myeloma because it's an arbitrary ten percent yeah. plasma cells. Then you have right. smoldering, and and we have a lot of patients that like have ten around ten percent in the first bone marrow, and then they have a new bone marrow in one year, and it's below ten percent. Mm. So I don't think that's a very good marker to say if you have more than 10%, of course, you probably have more risk of developing myeloma, but there are some amcus like smoldering patients as well that should, should not be treated because the treatment for myeloma is not, it has side effects and it's, so we need to be able to identify the right patients to treat early, I think. Right. And I've seen studies that say, if you know you have MGUS, that's actually quite helpful and you do better just probably because you're doing some follow-up right and you're exactly. able to, you know catch things before you have any organ damage or anything like that even at, um mm -hmm. well you if you have organ damage you have active myeloma but you know even yeah. as it progresses or whatnot exactly I, I think it has been showed both that the the overall survival is better if you have amcus previously and are being followed for that and you have less bone disease and, and kidney disease and a lot of things that affect your quality of life mm -hmm. are better. So I think it, it it is important to treat early, and I think we will we'll probably be doing it more in the future. We just need to identify the right candidates for it. Yeah. And what do you think are the ramifications of the findings of this study for active myeloma patients? Like, you know, how does it impact us all? Because I think this is a very valuable study, not just for the precursor condition patients, mm -hmm. but for other patients as well. Well. I think, of course, it's too late to screen if you have active myeloma, of course, but I think most cancer patients that I have met, they want to know how you can prevent this disease from happening and the, the things that affect the quality of life of myeloma patients, the bone disease and the, the anemia and, and kidney disease that I think a lot of people, they, they see that this makes sense, but for them personally, it probably will not make a difference. But mm -hmm. But the myeloma patients I meet, they, they think this makes sense to look at it from this angle. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, so thank you so much for giving us the overview. We're gonna come back in our discussion and continue to talk about this. But um, Dr. Mara, do you want to move on and explain um, why the microenvironment matters to disease and then how your work with MRD testing or minimal residual disease testing kind of intersects with that work? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for uh, inviting me. So our study, uh, we presented two uh, oral communications this year at ASH on microenvironment uh, and multiple myeloma uh, progression after treatment uh, and sustainable negativity, which means patients that have undetectable disease uh, using uh, very depth technology and accurate uh, approach uh, and two measurement uh, at least uh, uh, within the first year after treatment. So uh, patients that after the induction don't have any tumor cells detectable after a year. Um, so to do that, we combine two studies uh, led by Ola Langren. Uh, one is the Manhattan trial published uh, last, last year on JAM oncology, where patients were treated with uh, daratumab, carfizomib, revlimid, and dexamethasone in front line, so newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients. And the rate of MRD negativity was 70%, so extremely high compared to previous cycles, for example, with Belkade, Revlimid, Dexamethasone, which is still considered the gold standard. 
So the other study was the carfilzomib and red limit dexamethasone, which in another study that is supposed to provide 60% of negativity approximately across different studies. So what we did uh, is we uh, investigate uh, uh, in, I think, in a novel way, because most of the studies so far in multiple myeloma look or only the genomics, uh, like which DNA alterations affected tumor biology and the prognosis, or the microenvironment, like as a two separate compartment. We can look at the microenvironment and see this regulation, what is different from the normal or comparing the responder and non-responder. And we can look at the DNA and look at the same. But the point and the original, uh, the original, you know, why in our paper is original or, or um, is the is the fact that we actually combine both. So we look both at the microenvironment and the tumor genomics using whole genome sequencing. That it's a technology that not many groups are using, and I think it's currently the only one that is able really to capture all the genomic drivers or what we call myeloma-defining genomic events. So now what we found is that despite the limited sample set, because you know to really define which cases are high risk, you need probably thousands of cases. But despite the limited sample set, we definitely found some clear association. And there are distinct alteration, like uh, DNA alteration, like loss of a piece of a chromosome or a mutation or a certain complex event, like when a chromosome is completely altered and reassembled in a wrong way. So all these events matter for clinical outcome. But what was extremely important is that they matter also for the microenvironment composition. So what have been always fought, or not actually fought, but presented as a two different separate compartment are actually quite interconnected. And it doesn't surprise, after all, the microenvironment and immune system is altered because you have a tumor. Mm -hmm. And so you need to understand this connection, what we call interplay between immune system and the cancer cell. So I think this is the first study where this interplay has been investigated and has been shown that some of these, you know, association between tumor and microenvironment are actually very important for outcome. So we found that a certain gene or alteration uh, called XBP1, which might not, you know, it's one of the most important gene in multiple myeloma, and have been already reported as prognostic in different paper, is actually associated with poor prognosis in direct ARD, but also associated with a different immune microenvironment. Mm -hmm. And these differences uh, are differences that are found across different cancer types and are all associated with the poor response to immunotherapy. So these are not myeloma patterns. These are cancer immunotherapy patterns that we found, but we also found the link between why certain patients have this pattern because they have certain alteration. Obviously, this is just the beginning. It's like we need more data, more samples, uh, and more work to do. But I think it's pretty uh, intriguing and exciting what we found. I think what you found, like we, I know we did a video with you while you were at ASH, and I thought one of the interesting findings was, you know, you were studying the impact of genetics um, and tumor mutations with transplant, not with transplant, and those types of things. So that whole interplay, and I know patients ask all the time too, like, what's my immune system status? How do, how do I know if this immunotherapy is going to work for me or not? Yeah. Um, and what you're doing is studying that impact. So not just looking at, oh, do you have 414 myeloma or 1114 myeloma, but how does that affect the bone marrow microenvironment too? And you're starting to see, like I just did a couple of radio shows at the beginning of this year on things that are affecting like these myeloid derived suppressor cells or things that are changing for the worse inside the bone marrow microenvironment that may affect, you know, all that. So to me, what that study in integrating that is really, really important. So thanks yes. for doing that. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, you 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 said everything. I just can what what they can just add uh, is that uh, it's kind of uh, in a very simple uh, language. Immunotherapy works if you have an immune system. If we completely exhaust or destroy the immune system with our drugs, there is nothing left. Uh, and how these cells can work uh, if stimulated. So like you know, people talk about CAR T as a sort of uh, solution for all our problems. But actually, they are not, uh, at least not for all patients. And we need to understand why. And emerging data from lymphoma are exactly showing what you're saying, that patients with exhausted 
immune system. So the immune system is exhausted for the tumor, for the treatment, for all the drugs we gave to these patients before CAR T. And actually the one where CAR T are not able to really mount a good response and they fail the response. So because treatment is becoming so um, in, like power for most of the mama patients, unfortunately not for all, uh, we need also to better understand the impact on the long time. So like transplant is a, you know, obviously it's a, a, an old drug, it's still working in many patients, but you know, when you have alternatives that work in a similar or identical way, you always wonder why we need to give to all patients a drug that create a immune exhaustion or immune dysregulations that can be seen up to one year after transplant. That was the abstract probably you were referring presented by David Coffey uh, from our lab. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of, it, it's really neat. You know, when we think about patients, we need to think about quality of life, treatment, cancer genomics, but it is not only just curing the patient, it's also containing the toxicity, the long-term toxicity, the quality of life after treatment. Mm -hmm. All this consideration now that we are, you know, achieving all these great results needs to be more and more discussed. Yeah, I, and um, just, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I had a point and now I'm losing it. <laughs> the, the comment that I was going to make. Um, I'll, I'll come back to it, I'm sure. Um, I just think what, what, oh, I know what I was going to say. So you think about personalized medicine, you know, the research you've heard about personalized medicine, like the last 10 years or so, finding this genomic target and applying this um, specific drug to this genomic target. But what you're trying to work on is personalized medicine in a different way. You're trying to look at, yes, the genomics and, um, and, but, but also the immune system status. So how can you avoid giving therapy that's not going to work necessarily for that particular patient because of their immune system status, not just their genomics? And that to me is a more like broad, maybe potentially more successful approach because it just seems like there's so many mutations in myeloma that trying to find the right drugs to give to that particular patient, like a BRAF inhibitor and then this and then that is like almost impossible because it keeps mutating and whatever. So I don't know what you think about that in terms of personalized uh, medicine. Well, I'm obviously everyone, I think in the, in the medical world, uh, support personalized medicine and believe that's uh, the future, but you know, a future can be hundred years from now. Yeah, right. Year. So my personal opinion is that microenvironment uh, is not as great as DNA to predict outcome in patients. We have the, the studies published so far have a limited sample set, 20, 30, 50 patients. And the analysis are extremely complicated. Uh, and you know, these uh, different cell counts sometimes are not as accurate as you know we want to believe. Uh, mm -hmm. and also, they are extremely expensive. So mm -hmm. now uh, genomic investigation are much cheaper. They are stable because the mutation is a mutation. It's not that there is no variation from cell to cell. If it's there, it's there. The whole point is how we approach DNA. So if you ask me BRAF, that's a perfect example. But think about uh, a tumor like a tree. So if you treat the branches and you cut all the branches or some branches, you don't kill the tree. You just kill yeah. the branches. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about target therapy, we need to find the target therapy that is the real target. And what is the real target is the lesion that is shared by all cell. If a BRAF mutation is present in 20% of the cell, mm -hmm. even right. treatment, BRAF inhibitor, we kill only the 20%, 20% of cells. 80% will still be alive. So this, this seems to be simple complex, but I can assure you that in myeloma and in, you know, in different lymphomas, People just don't care about this. They just say, oh, you know, we have this mutation, it's mechanism of resistance. But if the mutation is present in 1% of the tumor, it's not the mechanism of resistance. Mm -hmm. Like 99% of the other cells don't have that mutation. So the fact that we just accept a certain data as real doesn't mean there's not something else. So that's the whole point of doing whole genome sequencing that's yeah. more comprehensive. Or that's the whole point to do other technology like uh, ATA-seq or RNA-seq. It's just very complicated, but I kind of, I don't think myeloma can be simplified. I think we need to accept this complexity and we need to deal with it. And 
the D and the only way is to combine data sets together. So mm -hmm. some groups are very good in sharing data. Others, unfortunately, they don't share data. That's obviously a problem. But if we combine, as we are doing in our myeloma research network, all the data set together, it's not just the numbers, it's also the statistical approach. There are these artificial intelligence approaches now. So it's not just the ability to detect mutation, also like the ability to predict and analyze data that is changing. We are living in a fantastic, era we have all this opportunity and you say future is one year 100 years it's not just a matter of how complex it's also how much people want to share and work together or how much people are willing to invest in this technology rather you know if still companies for example they still use 414 and 70p deletion has a poor prognostic high risk group in their trials and we know that they are not high risk anymore and you know, uh, Timothy will, will, will present this data. I mean, the concept of a risk has completely changed and just calling this patient high risk, is just a mistake that people are mm -hmm. keep doing. And you know, it's very hard to understand this data if they keep doing something that is not right. So I think we, we really need to change our approach to the definition of risk. And, and what you said, I think is in line. I think just for, it's easier right now to look at the DNA because we have more cases and, and it's more like, established but immune in the immune environment definitely is, is another component that needs to be investigated yeah so interesting it's so complicated but i'm so glad you're looking at this <laughs> um so dr schmidt um we're talking about genetics you've done some research on chromosome one and um will you kind of share what you found at, and presented at ash and then tell us more uh, just about what you learned about chromosome one Yes, absolutely. And uh, thanks so much for having me today. It's an honor to be here. And Dr. Mara, you know, had a kind of a perfect introduction to uh, the discussion of my research abstract, uh, which is really focused on these mutations, the chromosomal abnormalities that are the cause of why myeloma developed and may have something to do with why it acts the way that it acts the way that it does why some patients may experience early progression or stay in remission for a really, really long time. We're always trying to understand these better so that we know what are our expectations for an individual, uh, but also base this off of you know, broader data. And uh, the whole genome sequencing, everything like that that Dr. Mara was talking about is the future. This is a much more comprehensive way to evaluate what is the complexity of myeloma? What are its vulnerabilities and how to do this in the future? But what we have today uh, across countries and in almost all clinics is access to big chromosome abnormalities that are detected by something called FISH. Um, and you know, we know what some of the most common abnormalities are. And some of those are located on chromosome one, uh, specifically, extra copies of the long arm of chromosome one or one Q or deletion of its short arm. And we've known that these were common abnormalities for a long time, for decades. Uh, but the question has been is how important are these? Are these just things that we're seeing as they pop up in the myeloma cells or do they really have an impact on what we're expecting in terms of how long patients are gonna respond to therapy? Uh, and is there anything else that we can do about it? And recently, there's been a lot of focus on these abnormalities, uh, suggestion that extra copies of chromosome 1Q, uh, most pertin pertinently, may be associated with high-risk features uh, in multiple myeloma. But it's been complicated and hard to kind of adopt across systems because the details matter. Uh, it has something to do with what are the other chromosomal abnormalities, how many copies of chromosome 1Q are there, and some of the things that we're not routinely measuring. But as it is today, this is what we have access to. And so my research uh, abstract uh, really was a after the fact or post hoc analysis of a large phase three uh, study that was done here in the United States. Uh, the, the purpose of was really to evaluate whether or not um, VRD, which is currently the most commonly used induction therapy in myeloma, uh, whether or not it's switching out the bort uh, bortezomib for carfilzomib, which is a more potent proteasome inhibitor, might improve 
progression-free survival, meaning the time until myeloma stops responding to that therapy or if a, if a patient passes away, whether doing something stronger might help to improve that. And uh, the results of that study have been previously presented and the, the primary outcome showed that there was no difference between the two. But uh, this study was primarily designed for patients who didn't have high risk disease, as you know, we've kind of been alluding to different markers that might predict a shorter uh, time of uh, remaining in remission after initial response. Um, and uh, the thought is that perhaps using carfilzomib or more potent treatment might be more effective in high risk disease. Uh, we took advantage of this study knowing that uh, patients with chromosome one abnormalities, it was not specified because this was not known to be a high risk marker at the time mm -hmm. that the study was enrolling. Mm -hmm. So we went back, we looked at everybody's charts, found how many patients had extra copies of 1Q or loss of 1P and looked at their outcomes, both in general, and then whether or not individual treatment arms were more effective for those patients. And what we found was that even in this study population, which was almost entirely made up of patients who we would consider to be standard risk disease, meaning there weren't other high risk features like a deletion of 17P, 1416 translocation. There were patients with the 414 translocation enrolled, mm -hmm. uh, but 90% of the patients on the study had otherwise standard risk disease. And in this context, patients who had uh, extra copies of 1Q or loss of 1P mm -hmm. had worse progression-free survival with essentially nine months of triplet therapy with either VRD or KRD, followed by lenalidomide as a single agent. And so this, uh, and this remained a consistent factor. It was significant on what we call a multivariate analysis where we tried to control for other factors that might impact survival. Um, and it looked like uh, particularly uh, plus one Q or these extra copies of the long arm of chromosome one, uh, definitely had worse progression-free survival with this approach. In terms of the treatment arm, we saw there was no difference in that PFS between groups. When we started to get into smaller and smaller subgroups, there was the suggestion that possibly some of them might have benefited from switching to carfilzomib compared to bortezomib or Velcade. But the numbers are really small, and I think it's really hard to make strong conclusions about whether or not one is superior to the other. And I would say the key takeaway points from this study is that in a patient population that just gets RVD induction and followed by Revlimid, that if you've got chromosome one abnormalities, uh, it's less likely to have a, a progression-free survival, a time in remission that's lasting into the many years uh, perspective without something like a transplant. Uh, you know, thrown in there. Um, but again, this is, you know, based on older data, you know, we don't necessarily have all of the updated genomics and the other factors here. Uh, but I think that uh, this is important context for both physicians and patients who may have these abnormalities because they're present in a lot of patients, up to 40% of patients with newly diagnosed myeloma have chromosome one abnormalities. And so I think that it's important to have this information in terms of setting expectations and talking about uh, whether or not uh, doing something like a stem cell transplant and rolling on a clinical trial, uh, something like this may be uh, worth considering for patients with these abnormalities to try to improve outcomes and understand how best to treat everybody in the future. Oh, definitely. And and you mentioned, you kind of referred to this earlier, but like sometimes I've heard investigators say, so if you have the gain of 1Q, which is basically like you have three copies of the chromosome, maybe it's not as high risk, but I don't know if you're finding that in your study. But if you have, and I never understood the, de the delineation between like a gain and then this AMP, you know, which is they call the AMP of 1Q, which is four copies um that that is high risk sometimes that doesn't show up in your fish test so you just go hey i've got a gain of 1q i have no clue you know so um as a patient you probably my doctor would always say you know we can't win the war unless we understand the enemy so number one get genetic testing when you're first diagnosed 
so you know what you're dealing with and then you can do what you're saying is have this conversation with your doctor about okay maybe we need to be a little more aware or aggressive or do transplant or consider clinical trials like you're saying yeah yes absolutely and i totally understand the confusion about the gain 1q amp 1q this is a question that plagues even physicians you know who are out there trying to make sense of this uh, and I think that a big part of that is because there's really not been any sort of consensus definition. You'll go and read papers of, yeah. you know, single center studies that were done or uh, clinical trials and the definitions and how it was defined is all over the place. It's very difficult to kind of make sense of things and try to have a very clear uh, kind of sense of what exactly were the abnormalities that people were looking at and how was AMP 1Q defined from study to study. And so I think that uh, that's something that is, you know, currently in discussions about, you know, perhaps defining it. Uh, and then when we do uh, some of the whole genome sequencing data, we'll probably outdate it immediately. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I think that at least among us who study myeloma, you know, I think that what we're finding is that the copy number is probably the most reliable uh, factor and easily, uh, most easily repeatable uh, mm -hmm. factor that goes along with how important that extra copy of 1Q is. And having one extra copy uh, probably has some element of high risk, but it exists on a spectrum. And when you start adding four copies, five copies, or extra high risk genetic abnormalities into there, these are the types of ultra high risk, uh, you know, abnormalities in the genetics that we really need to pay attention to. And I think that all of this is on a spectrum, but that even our data showed that just having one extra copy of 1Q is something that uh, needs to be paid attention to. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. I, I think what we all three of you are doing is so unique and then so wonderful and so additive to the whole body of myeloma research. And um, as, as myeloma investigators, um, I don't wanna say you're super young because you're not, but like in, in terms of like having a very um, promising career ahead of you in the myeloma space, what do you see as, uh, what, what else did you hear at ASH? that we should be aware of that's exciting you. You know, you know, you talk to people that are in your stage and and then you know, you don't have people who had like VAD and you're not prescribing that kind of treatment to your patients. Um, so you're seeing these newer therapies and you're mostly involved in all these newer therapies. Um, what do you see as most promising? Uh, and what did you, did, let's have a group discussion. I think about, um, you know, what did you see and where do you see things shifting? You've kind of mentioned some of it, but um, Dr. Schmidt, why don't we start with you? Sure. So yeah, it is a very exciting time to be researching myeloma and plasma cell disorders. I think that we're uh, kind of in a renaissance of, you know, new treatment options, most of which seem to be effective uh, and in terms of figuring out how we're going to best utilize these new immunotherapies and targeted therapies and things like that to, you know, produce even longer survival times with better quality of life for all patients with myeloma. You know, from my perspective, I would say uh, we are all indebted to those who went through the phases where we were using VAD and, you know, all of these old chemotherapy and who kind of blazed the trail to what we're seeing now. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, it, it depends on which phase of myeloma you're looking at, what the most pertinent, you know, kind of outlook and, you know, findings from this year's ASH or just kind of in general are. You know, just to go with newly diagnosed myeloma, because that's what, you know, I was. Yeah, you can pick uh, one thing. I mean, there's like a bajillion things, right? Exactly. <laughs> I, I think that uh, the prospect is uh, figuring out what is that combination uh, that we can use to achieve really deep, durable responses uh, to, to achieve really high rates of 
MRD negativity, uh, which Dr. Morrow was, you know, referring to. And for many patients, you know, these really effective combination therapies are going to lead to long lasting remissions to where some myeloma docs are even, you know, using that other C word, uh, the cure word. And I'm not necessarily sure whether or not that is, you know, the, the place that we're in, but we are talking about, you know, survival times for many patients uh, without remission, you know, in the order of five, seven, 10 years, you know, uh, in, in first uh, response. But we also are, you know, learning more about this, about which factors might be present that might say, perhaps with some of those standard approaches, we're not going to see that and needing to use some more, uh, you know, some of our newer immunotherapies such as CAR-T and bispecifics in order to achieve those same outcomes and who we need to be more vigilant to. And I think we're moving away from this one size fits all approach of combination therapy until progression forever. Mm -hmm. There may be some patients who we use you know, a multi-drug combination for, you know, six to 12 months. And then once we've got a good response, we might be talking about treatment-free intervals for a long time. And that I think is incredibly exciting, but we need to figure out who this is the right approach for and, you know, tailor that therapy to individuals. So I think that that's, you know, I think the most exciting thing for me is to, you know, start looking at how we can, optimize, you know, quality of life during this journey, as well as just, spe you know, uh, speaking about survival. Mm -hmm. About, uh, I'm happy to hear yeah. what the others think too. Yeah, Dr. Thompson, <laughs> daughter, um, do you want to share your perspective? Uh, well, yes, I think I'm a little bit less experienced than the others in treating myeloma patients, but uh, I work also in a very different healthcare system where, I mean, we get things a little bit later, I think. Um, mm -hmm. We're not allowed to use upfront the same things that you might use in the US, but and we are using VRD for induction treatment for, for most patients here. And I think a lot of my the myeloma doctors here in the, the Nordics are hoping to be able to use other drugs like daratumumab earlier. Um, that is something that we're kind of hoping for. But but of course, I'm also impressed with the, the bispecific antibodies, the results they're showing, and, and the CAR T. That is something that is giving a lot of hope, I think. But of course, for the healthcare systems that we have, it needs to be affordable and realistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I think that is something we think a lot about here in the, in the Scandinavian countries. Um, and I'm wondering if you could think, I mean, if you if you're using some of these immunotherapies and moving them to earlier lines of therapy, could you avoid some of the cost? I mean, when you think about, you know, if you have a more effective therapy or a more durable therapy that has fewer side effects, and then it's, you know, I mean, the CAR T and bispecifics haven't been tested in combinations in any way yet. But um, you know, so I don't know if that will happen or well, not. But... I don't know. And, and, and some other diseases like CLL, they have been showing that if you have a good enough second line treatment, you cannot show a, a survival benefit with uh, using a different induction treatment or first line treatment. So I think um, it's difficult to show that it's, it's cost effective mm. to use a very expensive first line treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but of course, you want to use the, the treatment that has the as little side effects as, as possible, and 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 uh, yes, is is comfortable for the for the patients. So, and we think about that a lot because uh, admissions they cost also. <laughs> right, and most efficacious. I mean, when we ask patients like, okay, what do you want? They like most efficacious, fewest side effects, lowest cost. <laughs> so. Yes. I think everybody's sort of aligned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in what we want. Is there anything else that stood out to you at Ash? Uh, well, I was really impressed by the the, the flow cytometry uh, studies by Bruno Peva group. They were studying there because I'm thinking, of course, a lot about the precursor conditions, how we can identify the MCUS-like type disease, and then they had a very impressive. Uh, study where they showed a flow cytometry, um, like how they could identify MCUS-like type in both smoldering and MCUS patients that 
would not progress to a more aggressive disease. But they also did a study on, on peripheral blood with flow cytometry, where they could see that um, find uh, individuals that were at very high risk of progression with smoldering myeloma mm -hmm. that had um, uh, plasma cells in the peripheral blood that they could identify with flow cytometry. So I, I think that was very interesting. So better testing. I mean, that kind of goes back to this whole genome sequencing idea too. Like the, mo the better testing you have, the more information you have and the earlier testing that you're doing is- Exactly. You're gathering all the info that you need. I, I we have so many, sorry. We have so many technologies now with the, mm -hmm. the whole genome sequencing, the cytogenetics, the mass spec, the, we, it's really hard to, to find out what is the best way to to monitor patients both in the, in the uh, in the remission states and and also in the precursor states and, and I think we need to like uh, Dr. Mara was talking about we need to work together and, and share the data and, and find out the optimal ways that are sensible and uh, mm -hmm. best for patients and, and cost effective so yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'm just, and I think it's really overwhelming how much is being presented. I think it's quite hard to figure out what is the best way right now. But yeah, right. But I'm, I'm always learning. Yeah, I think everybody is. Dr. Mara, um, the patients are for sure. We're learning from you. Yes. So, Dr. Mara, what's your perspective on, on Ash? Thank you. Yeah, Ash is always overwhelming uh, as. Yes. Uh, as just said, uh, and uh, there are obviously different levels, right? It's like drug development, the clinical trials, uh, biology. So I think that for, for, clini for clinical trial, I think what is the most original and important trials, in my opinion, is the one that Luciano Costa presented with the master trial, it was also published on JCO a few weeks after Ash, because that's exactly the right direction. When you think about what we want to do, do we want to do four drugs versus three drugs and mm. see who's gonna win? Or do we want to, and we know who's gonna win, we just need that because FDA needs that for the approval. So I'm not saying that it's wrong to do that. I'm just saying that that's what we need to get the drug to the patient, not in the trial. But the trial from Luciano Costa actually just show that if you have sustained MRD negativity after mm. induction, you can stop lenalidomide maintenance. And so that's, you know, it's, it's super. I mean, it's yeah. not, in, in, yeah. in chronic myeloidal leukemia, they already do that. Like 50% of patients can stay out of uh, DKI inhibitors without any problems. They still have some disease somewhere probably, but it's kind of fine, they live their life. So think about like financial burden, lenalidomide is the second mm -hmm. most expensive drug for Medicare. Uh, so it's patients cannot afford some timing. So I mean, it's, this is like a very important study oriented to the patient, not just to three months more PFS uh, or yeah. whatever endpoint that really doesn't matter. So that's, I think is, I think one of the most important study I, uh, I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you, Dr. Mara. I think that the master study, what at the time it was designed and, you know, started was, you know, kind of the first of its kind using uh, MRD as a means to basically uh -huh. def try to determine whether patients could stop therapy early and give patients a time off of treatment, um, and, you know, which is so important. You know, most cancers that are out there are not treated with indefinite therapy like myeloma is. Uh, and figuring out who we might be able to do this for is critical. And I, you know, I think the data speak for themselves. I'm not sure that this is practice changing, you know, for everybody, you know, across the world yet, uh, because it wasn't really randomized, but it's a proof of concept mm -hmm. that if you've got somebody who has an outstanding response to initial therapy and remains without any, you know, detection of residual disease with our most sensitive techniques time after time after time, that stopping maintenance therapy is feasible for most patients. And I do think this goes along with the risk stratification things that we were talking about too, because what also was shown in the master study was that patients with two or more of these high risk cytogenetic abnormalities, 
even though they would achieve MRD negativity, may not have had quite as long of a period of time where the myeloma stayed under control. And so this is you know, why we need to do as thorough of a job as we can understanding myeloma. What is really somebody's risk profile? Which type of strategy may work out very well for somebody so that we achieve years of survival with minimal, if no, you know, even no therapy? Uh, whereas some people may need a different approach early on. And I think that, you know, the cost considerations, you know, if we invest up front to figuring this out, the cost of medications, the toxicity, everything like that may in fact go down in the long run if we're able to adequately treat this up front. Yeah, so interesting. So um, the yeah, regarding the immunotherapy, uh, obviously, we, I think like more than half of the presentation I touched were kind of immunorelated uh, in myeloma. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that's obviously is a big deal. It's, all, it's always, uh, you know, matter to really understand the data, right? It's not just looking at the 100% of the response rate from certain trial where actually not all patients achieve because some don't even get the CAR T because they couldn't get the you know the construct so there are a lot of excitement there is also need for cautiousness and try to not just get too much excited also one thing i always remember to my collaborators in the lab in particular is that what you're looking at the relapse trial is not the real high risk because the real high risk don't arrive to the third lines to get CAR T. they progress they are just refractory all the time mm -hmm. and patients, we just don't include them in trials. We just don't publish them. But they are like a lot of patients that we just miss. And then we have the elderly patient. All these trials are like less than 65 or very fit uh, over 65 years old patients. But you know, 70, 60% of myeloma patients are above 65 years old. So we always need to not forget like the frail, this, the very high risk, uh, the patients that are not including clinical trial because they creatinine is more than 2.5. Mm -hmm. You know, all these patients are, are kind of, it's really important to have a broader approach and see how this drug works also in group of patients that we don't know yet. And it's good that this drug works in a, in a low risk, but you know, everything works in low risk. 30% uh, of patients in the whole GMEMA trial in Italy VT, for VTD double transplant are still in remission at 10 years follow-up, like 30%. So mm -hmm. you can give whatever you want on those patients. They will always get a long response. Uh, what is really challenging is really identifying, as Timothy says, the high-risk patients, but the real one, not like the one with 414 only. So we need one cue, for example. That's definitely something that you know, if I were FDA or someone, I would require that as a minimal standard for high risk. And the deletion 70P is not high risk without the mutation. No matter what people said, there are many papers observations that show that. So again, why do you want to call someone high risk if it's not really a risk, or at least you don't know it? So we need to change the paradigm and be more, you know, that's kind of my word of caution is of immunotherapy that always is going to change multiple myeloma in five years from now we will use probably this biospecific uh, or CAR-T in, in, in a lot of patients mm -hmm. more than now but we need to understand I think and you know take more time to look at the details and to really get a feeling of, of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Uh, no go ahead. I think some of what you were saying that we have we have looked at it in the Danish and the Swedish myeloma registries, which contains all of the myeloma patients that are diagnosed with uh, in whole countries, and less than half of the real patients could be included in clinical trials when we apply the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. So it's really not representative, mm -hmm. of, but we are still seeing. Of course, it's. A bit behind in, in the timeline, but we are seeing a benefit in these patients with the, the VRD treatment. Mm -hmm. So so far so good, but of course it's it's behind in, in, in the treatment protocols. Well, and what you all said about sharing research, I mean, this is why our foundation, one of our flagship products that we developed is this Health Tree Cure Hub patient registry. But it's it's something that gives back to patients and helps patients navigate their disease. 
but we have over 10,000 patients who participated because you really need to see what's happening in the real world. And we're opening that up to investigators like you uh, for free to be able to access that information as like one other data set that you have to work with um, for these types of studies. So I would encourage patients that are listening that if you want to help contribute to that, to this myeloma cure, because we all, this is what we want, is a myeloma cure, um, you know, participate in it. And as investigators, you know, let's talk about how you can access it. Music